This is Judaism Unbound, episode 38, Judaism and Evolving Dharma. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofus. We're here today in the second of four episodes on the sensibilities that will guide the future of Jewish life with our guest, Jay Michelson. Uh, We sort of tongue-in-cheek think of this as the non-Jewish sensibilities episode. Uh, Jay is going to help us think about how, as uh, a future Judaism comes about, how the kinds of Jewish sensibilities that we talked with John Wucher and Lee Moore about last week might intermix with sensibilities that come from other sources. Jay, in particular, is an expert in Buddhism. He has written about it in uh, a book called Evolving Dharma, Meditation, Buddhism, and the Next Generation of Enlightenment. In addition to that, Jay is probably the most overqualified person we've ever had on the show. He has a PhD from Hebrew University in Jewish thought. He has a JD from Yale Law School, an MFA from Sarah Lawrence, a BA from Columbia, and also he has rabbinic ordination, non-denominational rabbinic ordination. He uh, has written six books, Uh, He is a columnist for the Jewish Daily Forward, very famously in the Jewish community. He also is a columnist for the Daily Beast, and he is the founder of two LGBT Jewish organizations, uh, a very frequent speaker at Jewish gatherings, a someone who is really kind of uh, provoking us to think uh, seriously in Jewish life about everything in in different ways. And we are uh, incredibly excited to have Jay with us today on Judaism Unbound. Jay, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. To get started, we really wanted to go into this topic of, you know, what we sort of are calling Jewish sensibilities and non-Jewish sensibilities, uh, for want of a better pithy way of talking about it. But the basic idea is that as we look at the Judaism of the future, the question, in a sense, is what Jewish material is going to be mixed in inside the Judaism of the future? And then what material that comes from outside of Judaism is going to be mixed into that material? And, and I know that that's something that you've probably thought on both sides of that ledger, and you've, you've definitely written about the role of Eastern religion and Eastern ideas coming into Judaism. And so I, I was hoping you could just start by talking about some of that stuff and how, you think about, how you're thinking about it these days. You know, I think sensibility is an interesting word, an interesting place to kind of start. I was just actually editing a piece on a totally separate subject, kind of the evolution of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender theologies, and talking about the concept of a, of a gay sensibility in religious conversation, and thinking of it as less about content, it's not about verses or something like that, and more about style. Uh, you know, kind of certain kind of ir- irony or an almost a camp sensibility and things like that too. You know, I think we're at a transitional moment on the on the Jewish sensibility side because um, what we've seen and understood to be a Jewish sensibility for the last I don't know 50 odd years post war America uh, is clearly shifting, right? And you know, it was understood that we even have shorthand phrases for it, like oh that person's a bagel and locks Jew. Well, yeah, I mean that's that's a certain kind of Jew from, you know, Eastern European roots or at least some kind of European, mostly Ashkenazic roots. Uh, but that may not appeal to a lot of people from Sephardic communities or backgrounds or certainly adult Mizrahi and Mizrahi in Israel and things like that. You know, that's just a, a trivial example, but I think that's also true on, on deeper levels. It is this strange moment where the old school Jewish sensibilities are as ubiquitous as ever, as ever right? So whether it's Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign or the eternal endurance of Seinfeld in, in syndication, syndicated television, there's a lot of like that kind of Judaism probably more visible than, you know, than it has been in decades. Uh, and yet just at that moment, obviously through hybridization, through multiple faith marriages and, and families and an under, of, other, uh, of other currents, that's shifting and it's transforming. You know, ironically for me, when I spend time in, in Buddhist spaces, because I teach uh, meditation and a Buddhist lineage as well as being an ordained rabbi, it's actually some of the most Jewish spaces that I hang out in. Uh, in terms of sensibility, right, because the Western Dharma was so heavily populated with American Jews, mostly secular American Jews, who brought their own sensibility and their own psychoanalytic perspective and their own kind of iterations of, of what the problem of humanity is and what it is to be happy and things like that. You know, some of that's determined by a, a North Indian prince uh, from the Axial Age, but a lot of it is determined by people who would otherwise be psychoanalysts on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. So it's funny that in terms of sensibility, I think one reason that it's so easy to do that that Buddhist-Jewish integration is that the kind of Dharma traditions, Buddhism, Hinduism, and others that are, are being integrated are already 
uh, packaged for Western consumption by Asian teachers and then repackaged again by Western teachers. So when people are resistant to the idea of of Jewish syncretism, of the idea of other religious ideas coming into Judaism, I mean, when I hear that kind of resistance, I sort of laugh a little because I think about how much of Judaism in sort of every previous iteration involved so much importation of material from the cultures that the Jews were living in. You know, I'm thinking about rabbinic Judaism being so influenced by Greek thought, which was the dominant tradition, you know, the dominant intellectual tradition of its time. And I remember when I was uh, first encountering some of the people who were doing various Jewish versions of Eastern practices a decade or so ago, it just struck me as so obvious that, of course, that's the next stage because that is the main new thing going on in the society, in American society, in which the, the Jews are living. And so wouldn't it be the natural next step that we would start to see Eastern ideas coming into Judaism? And is that how you see it? Sure, yeah. I, th I mean, I think, you know, what you said is certainly right. I mean, there's a great irony of Jews sitting down to a Passover Seder, which is derived from a symposium and which was in part designed as a refutation of uh, Jewish Christian claims in the in the first centuries of the Common Era and complaining about Jewish imports, <laughs> uh, <laughs> or you know coming up on a harvest festival which used to be a purely pagan or earth-based festival and then got overlaid with a Jewish narrative of uh, you know the Exodus from Egypt or, uh, or something like that and then got overlaid with a different er uh, a different narrative and also complaining about hybridization. It's like when, you know, especially like with Sukkot, you know, when Jews complain about you know, paganism and then they go wave their magical vegetables in the four directions, <laughs> or six, the six directions, even more so. Uh, so that's certainly true. I, there is certainly a, always a, a concern, I think, about um, whether there's a dilution or a diminution in, of, of quality with uh, this or that uh, importation and, and syncretization. Interestingly, uh, you know, if you really look at the sweep of Jewish history, it's rarely the ones who are hybridizing that actually find, you find a diminishment of, of rigor and discourse. It's actually more when the tradition ossifies or tries to isolate itself uh, that it goes into a sort of wayward uh, and weird direction. But, you know, I was just reading there's a, a wonderful new um, academic book about the Sabbatean movement, you know, which at one point attracted as many as one third of European Jews to a, an ultimately false messianic claim in the in the 17th century. Um, and, you know, which led to a lot of experimentation and hybridization and new ideas and ultimately led to the rise of Hasidism and 20th century spirituality as we know it today, but which also represented a real trauma. You know, and that's, so that's it's always been five minutes to midnight in Jewish history. Uh, and so there's always been a, a fear that this next trauma is going to be uh, the worst one ever. And sometimes those those fears are realized. And so how do you think about, I mean, this is something that we've been starting to sort of struggle with. We've been talking a lot about the process of change, but it's important to start to think a little bit about the content side of what Judaism is and might become. I mean, how do you think that modern Jews should be thinking about you know, and I, I don't mean this in a simplistic way, but essentially what makes Judaism Judaism, you know, and how do we think about major changes in Judaism and, you know, on the one hand, being open to new importation and the other hand, having some sense that, look, I mean, if the other thing was, was so great, why don't we just do that instead? Now we're free to, you know, what what is the way to think about the material of Judaism and the material of other potential importations and, and the potential remix that that results, you know, what ultimately makes it really Judaism? For me, the answer has to be something about working with the set of tools and materials that are out there and that history has bequeathed us. And that's about it, <laughs> you know, that there is this parameter of, uh, you know, let, this is Jewish space, whatever that means, and here are the things that occur in Jewish space and some kind of wrestling with that. And the reason I'm so minim minimalistic about the definition, you know, is that, you know, for many people, millions of people, uh, this is an ethnicity marker, and it's about nationalism. And so they can't, for the life of them, understand why you wouldn't always root for our team as, uh, you know, against some other team, mm -hmm. because that's what it is. This is about being on a team, and it's about being in a family and being in a group. 
And, you know, that's definitely not how I see it. Uh, I do see that as a, a little part, of, not even a little part, a significant part of Jewishness in the 21st century. But to me, when it's it's truest to the Judaism I'm interested in, to sometimes oppose Jews when they're on the wrong side of Jewish values, whether that's on, you know, some American political context or whether it's the context of Israel-Palestine or, or what have you. You know, I think the, just as the prophets in ancient Israel oppose what the Israelites were doing sometimes, uh, so too those of us who aspire to walk in their footsteps uh, need to oppose what Jews are doing now. So it, it to me, is not about just a team. You know, it would be interesting to see if, um, you know, uh, Isaiah or Jeremiah were allowed to speak at a Hillel. I mean, they say such negative things about it. You know, maybe they, should, they shouldn't be allowed in. Well, they weren't really warmly welcomed in their time either. <laughs> Well, that's uh, you know that uh, I think that's why I have such a minimal definition. So for some people, obviously it's religion; for some, it's culture. Uh, so even the type of activity that we're engaged in, um, and you know what it is that we're meant to be doing, it's, it goes beyond for me like the the substance. It's it's kind of like what's even the grammar of the sentence that we're trying to write uh, or the question that we're trying to ask. It's not even just the vocabulary, um, and I think it's it. I think it's a little bit fruitless uh, to insist that, oh, well, it has to have these 10, cate- these 10 characteristics, otherwise it's not really Jewish enough. You know, it's not even enough, it's not even adequate to say, well, Judaism is what Jews are doing, because it's also, you know, a lot of Jews are doing things that they don't identify as Judaism. And I'm not going to, you know, impose that definition on someone else. You know, it's like when uh, people would insist before Steven Spielberg really became a Jewish director, you know, with Schindler's List and so on, like, is there something Jewish about Steven Spielberg? And, you know, I write for the forward, they do this all the time, the, you know, the, the secret Jewish history of Metallica mm-hmm. or something. Um you know, for me, that's super super uninteresting. I'm not going to delegitimize it. If that's what somebody's into, that's great. But, you know, for me, there are plenty of Jews who do things that aren't Judaism and, and aren't do things that aren't Jewish, probably a majority, actually. Um, so even saying it's what people create is uh, is not quite up to par. So, you know, for me, it does have something to do with are you playing in the sandbox? Um, and if you if you choose to play in the sandbox for from whatever position, uh, whether it's being the bully in the sandbox or throwing sand in the bully's eyes in the sandbox, both are in the sandbox. And um, so it has something to do with that for me, which I realize is a little minimalistic. But uh, I always come back to uh, Kurt Vonnegut, one of his characters, I forget who it was, who was asked what the meaning of life is. I think it was his prophet, uh, it's his religion. In uh, Kurt Vonnegut books, he said, we're here to help each other get through this thing, whatever it is. I am really intrigued by what you said about sort of the nationalistic element of Judaism and sort of rooting for a team almost as how some Jews engage in Judaism. And I was curious because a recent piece you wrote sort of brought up some of those themes and I'd love to hear you expand. It was about Pokemon Go, um, which we've actually mentioned on some earlier episodes of ours. But I think that it's really important to think about how things like augmented reality and and other technology technological shifts that are already ex, that we're already experiencing or that we will experience how those will affect our world and for those of us living in the Jewish world how it'll affect Judaism and I'm curious if you could expand on why it is that Pokemon Go might relate to a shift away from sort of the nationalist impulses or tribal impulses that you were talking about before so I think, yeah, I think uh, two reasons, but with a preface first, right? So Pokemon Go itself is just, you know, step 1.2 and, you know, a, a thousand step journey toward augmented reality, virtual reality, and so forth. So when we're talking about it, we're not really talking about Pokemon Go. We're talking about the, the trend that it's a very early, early, early exemplar of. It's like, you know, I was, I dialed into my first uh, bulletin board system in 1985 on a 300 baud modem. You know, I don't think we really understood what the internet was, but we understood that this was a, <laughs> something new that was coming on that was that might change things. And that's where we are, I think, right now. So with, with Pokemon Go, but I think there are two reasons. First, you know, it illustrates how communities can be formed in a kind of ad hoc way. I uh, didn't really talk about this that much in the piece, but the actual community of users and and so forth. But second, and I think more importantly, you know, people do people associate with groups uh, and activities and identities for various reasons. We get things out of it, and one of those is a uh, you know our, our Jewish identities. 
you know, I think the notion of experience, human experience, uh, shifts with augmented reality in a serious way. Certainly religious experience as a subset of that. Um, so, you know, on the trivial level, I say trivial, but on a simple level, you know, it might be different ways to do Jewish together, you know, whether, I mean, it's right now it doesn't feel very inspiring to uh, say Kaddish with a minion online, but, well, what if it is, what if uh, that minion really feels like they're all around you and it's your friends and they're supporting you as you say Kaddish or something like that? Um, but even more radically, you know, as experience changes, the things we look for in our communities change. So I'm thinking about the impulse to play in the sandbox like you were talking about. And there's the tribal impulse that says, you know, these are my people. And, and so, uh, you know, let's play in this in our sandbox. But I guess that um, it's more interesting to me, you know, I guess where my optimism is. And I hope that there's a reason to play in the Jewish sandbox because there's something really good in it, right? Like the sand is really good. We have good shovels and pails. Good shovels and <laughs> pails, good sand, um, such that it's not even, right? I mean, like you're, you're talking about the that many Jews do a lot of things that reasonably shouldn't be uh, deemed to be Jewish, or, you know, they're not really any more Jewish than anything else. Um, but on the flip side of that, you know, I can imagine a lot of non-Jews that are interested in playing in the Jewish sandbox or with the Jewish sand in the same way that many Jews are interested in playing with the Buddhist sand. Um, and, and I guess at the end of the day, like what I'm curious about is this question of, as you see it, Going back to that Vonnegut quote, you know, what is the what is the purpose? You know, what is the purpose other than tribal of trying to retain a Judaism that that has value? You know, what what is it that you think people are looking for in their lives that they are able to potentially get it from institutions like Judaism or like Buddhism or or the various other uh, play, sandboxes in which you try to play? Yeah, and first, I totally agree, right? I mean, I think ultimately the the Judaism worth perpetuating is the Judaism that creates better and better uh, pails and shovels. Um, and uh, and I agree that we've already, over the last 2,500 years, created some really good ones. And that's why I'm in it. Partly, I'm sure I'm in it because it is my family and it is my, you know, my roots. But uh, I think the reason that I still, you know, don't give up has to do with, uh, you know, with a very unique set of languages and spiritual technologies and ethical traditions and technologies that we do bring to the table. So, you know, some of those, you know, I think I think ethical monotheism was a pretty good idea in, in general. I think we might want to update it a little bit and, uh, you know, depatriarchalize it and uh, and reground it in the body and the earth and and learn from other traditions as well. But, you know, this is a, a there's incredibly rich traditions of uh, of tech and of teaching and of poetry uh, and of music and of culture and of justice struggle and uh, and a, a really unique or close to unique uh, positionality relative to Western civilization, the insider outsiders uh, who have been the outsiders within uh, for 1,500 to 2,000 years of, of diaspora. You know, that's led to some really distinctive perspectives on, uh, on self and other and, uh, and on what it is to be a, a citizen of the West I do think that, you know, the the notion of justice as primary is one that is still something really valuable to think about. For me, in the Theravadan Buddhist world, you know, the, the Buddha set out to find out why we suffer. He was always asked again and again by teachers to take positions on various other issues, like cosmological issues, like what's the, is the earth eternal or was it created or, you know, what happens after we die? And, you know, they wanted him to answer these religious doctrinal questions. And in general, you know, he really would draw the, draw the questioner back again and again and said, you know, I teach about suffering and the end of suffering. Why do we suffer, you know, as human beings and what can we do about it? And that, I think, is a profoundly important question. I also think it's a profoundly important question to ask how can we help each other get through this thing, whatever it is, which although Kurt Vonnegut wasn't super Jewish, the uh, <laughs> that quote actually I think is. You know, and it, it actually... I. I don't think Judaism is primarily interested in uh, suffering and the end of suffering or happiness on a personal level. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, how can we, how can we uh, minimize suffering on a group level and on an interpersonal level? And those are really valuable uh, pails and shovels to, to bequeath to the next generation. And, and uh, in addition to the wealth of the literature and the library and the, 
the experiences that can be offered. I do I do wonder on the spiritual experience side, which obviously I'm particularly interested in, if those won't be synthesized or synthesizable in just a few decades, that, you know, no matter how awesome your Friday night davening is, your virtual reality experience will be even better. Uh, that's an interesting question. It's hypothetical right now because right now we're just at that 300 baud level. But I think it's clear, too, that there are so many different sets of tools. You made a point earlier that I would love to return to, or really you just sort of made a reference in passing that I want to return to, because I think it's something that people might not fully be aware of. They might have a subtle awareness, but haven't really explored it much. And that's this phenomenon that there are, as you said, a ton of American Jews who are deeply immersed, not only as participants in American Buddhism, but as leaders of it. And and that many of these people, they, they I mean, some of them might identify as having left Judaism, but others really don't. And as you've said, balance, you know, teaching Buddhist meditation with, for you being a rabbi, but for others just being uh, an involved member of of the American Jewish world. And I was wondering if you could just sort of give us a window into, into that balancing act, if it's a balancing act, and if you know any of the history about how that's sort of evolved, because it really is this fascinating historical thing that percentage wise there are just so such a disproportionate number of american jews that have risen to really important roles in buddhism right yeah no that is that is the case now i get to plug my book evolving dharma meditation buddhism the next <laughs> generation of enlightenment which which has one chapter uh on on this subject in particular um you know and it, it evolves in in uh, a kind of a mixture of of uh chance and non chance you know, a lot of it has to do with American Jewish post-war prosperity uh, and who were the people who were involved in spiritual seeking. Uh, so people who had had some interest or taste in something spiritual but not had it, not had it met necessarily in the American Jewish post-war context of the 1960s, 50s, 60s, 70s. You know, I'm really in the second generation. Uh, the first generation of, uh, of Boo Jews are baby boomers. Uh, who were written about in Roger Kamenetz's The Jew and the Lotus. And it is true, you know, there are three major schools, uh, sects, or streams, I guess, of Buddhism in the West. Uh, and uh, one is sort of the mindfulness stream, and that's that's where a lot of the Jewish names are, like Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg and Jack Hornfield. You know, they, they just came from that particular post-war milieu that also gave us Philip Roth and, you know, all of, the, all of that sort of angsty culture of that period. In the Zen world, though, as well, there are you know leading Jews like uh, Bernie Glassman, for example, one of the most important Zen Buddhist uh, teachers, and a little bit less in the Tibetan world, the Tibetan uh, Buddhist world. So that's the third stream, um, partly because there are actually a lot of Tibetans who are still uh, who are in positions of leadership. But uh, another Dharma friend of mine, Lama Surya Das, is uh, still very much a Brooklyn Jew in the way he uh, talks and acts and teaches. And uh, you know, it's it's actually. For him, I think it's the opposite of a tight a tight rope, um, or that's what you said, a balancing act. Uh, for him, it's an integration act, and I think that's true for me too. Hopefully, not just an act. You know that it's about being <laughs> true to ourselves and not uh, not necessarily. I mean, he does have right the uh, the Indian name, but he got the Indian name from a, a guru before he became a Buddhist, actually. Uh, but for me, I don't experience it as a balancing act. I mean, I really, there are, are occasions where I really do want to hang out in Jewish space and time. But uh, I was thinking just on the way over before we did this podcast, like if I had to do Judaism, you know, as my entire religious path or and then my professional life too, I just would go crazy. I mean, these people are nuts. They're so neurotic, <laughs> like the tightness and the thing and the money and the this and the that and the yelling and the Israel and the... Oh my God! It would just drive me bananas. And so there's a lot of times where I just want to get the hell out of there, and and I do, and I go off on a silent retreat for a month, or you know, just spend time in in some other community, and and that's just how I am. Uh, I, I think that's part of um, just whatever, whether it was genetics or the, my upbringing or whatever. You can you know, I don't I don't really care, but it was it's part of what this uh, personality is like, and um, so I don't experience it as a balancing act. I, I do see the sensibilities is very different. But as I said earlier, because of that preponderance of Jews in the American Buddhist scene, it's actually very Jewy there. It's funny to see sometimes what their uh, projections are about what they think Jews are supposed to be like, let alone rabbis. I, I usually closet the rabbi part when I go off into uh, into Buddha land. Um, 
just because uh, I don't want to hold people's projections of what they think a rabbi is supposed to be. But, you know, it feels very, at this point, very natural, uh, partly because, uh, you know, for me, the, the essence of the Dharma practice is really just being with what is, seeing things clearly, letting go a little bit more easily, not getting quite as caught by pushing away the unpleasant or grabbing onto the pleasant. Very simple stuff. Like uh, there's great esoteric Buddhism too, that's at, at least as baroque as anything in the Kabbalah. But for me, the simple stuff works uh, the best. Earlier on, you alluded to sort of this secret history of Metallica or whatever phenomenon that happens in the forward. I'm curious if you if you can just sort of give. Uh, a lay of the land. I mean, we, we haven't talked about Jewish journalism at all. We haven't really talked about the Jewish press on our show. And I feel like its role is really important. I mean, people really do, I mean, certain segments of the Jewish population really do pay attention to the forward, to JTA, to these kinds of big ticket Jewish publications, and occasionally, occasionally, their local Jewish papers too. And I was just curious if you could give us an over an overview of how the Jewish press is looking right now, and if it relates at all to these questions of nationalism, tribalism, of hybridization with other traditions. I mean, all the things we've talked about, sort of how does Jewish journalism play a role there, if, if at all? Sure. So, yeah, I think there's two worlds, right, the American and the Israeli scene. And the Israeli scene really is under siege right now. You know, it's one of the untold stories of the, of the Netanyahu administration that there's been a real cur- curtailing of uh, press freedom. And, you know, with Sheldon Adelson funding Israel Hayom and with other right-wing funders involved in the Israeli media, you know, it's really hard for Haaretz to kind of continue holding out just as, the you know, this one bastion. I think they will hold out, uh, certainly for a while, but it's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a darkening situation uh, in Israel uh, for, for journalists. You know, here in the United States, no one knows how to make money doing journalism, really, so the Jews are not alone necessarily. Uh, I think there are some pretty admirable efforts to pivot both from the forward and, and JTA. We've really kind of shaken up what they do in the last few years and others. You know, it's, it's a challenging financial proposition when you're reaching an audience that's as small as uh, the American Jewish audience is from a, from a large, you know, advertiser's point of view. So, you know, it's always going to be worth it for the new Natalie Portman movie to take ads in the forward as they have, but not necessarily the old Natalie Portman movie, by which I mean Star Wars. So, you know, it's right. not right. And there's more yeah. money in Star Wars, definitely. Than so, you know, just from the from the the models that do work, uh, it's a it's a tricky time. And uh, you know, I just I just won an award from the American Jewish Press Association. I'm really excited by that. You know, and it's it's tricky in terms of transition because a lot of the uh, you know a lot of the sort of uh, philanthropic supporters of, of Jewish press, local and national, uh, are um, interested in the more kind of sentimental thing, and that's one reason that they that they fund it. And God bless them because they pay my my rent. But uh, figuring out how that transitions to the next generation in the Jewish journalism side, I think, is is absolutely a, a kind of an open question. You know, on, on a macro scale, I I wonder if it'll be a little bit similar to Judaism in general, which is that there still will be these kinds of larger institutions, but they may not be the ones where the real dynamism is happening. Um, you know, and it may well be that the, the better funded Jewish uh, journalistic outlets, uh, which are more nationalistic and which publish stuff, which I think, you know, would, would be called racist if it were not in a Jewish publication on a regular basis. Uh, those may end up being, being dominant um, if the, tr- if the community as a whole you know, really does reflect and support that more nationalistic orientation. As it, it happens, they really don't. You know, people do vote with their feet, and uh, American Jews are still relatively progressive politically and are still more or less integrated uh, and interested, I should say, um, in, in culture more broadly. So, but if, if, if the community shifts and really supports those kinds of more ethnocentric uh you know, this is what we do in uh, kinds of publications that may be, that may well be the future. And then, you know, the talented Jewish American writers will do what I do. You know, I, I, you know, most of my writing isn't for the forward, right? So now I'm, at the, I'm speaking to you from the Daily Beast office. I, I love working here. You know, I'm right across the way from Gideon Resnick, who's Jewish. And other people, you know, a lot of people who have Jewish names and, and Jewish identities. And um, it's hard to make a case 
for a vital, interesting writers thing in the Jewish fold if places like the forward, I don't want to like, seem like I'm pushing the forward because I do work there, but you know, if places like that uh, can't make it in the long term. I um, wanted to go back to what you talked about at the very beginning of our conversation when we were talking about sensibilities and you talked about recently uh, thinking about or writing about the gay sensibility. And I was particularly interested in your thoughts on the LGBTQ sort of story within Judaism of the last decade or two. You know, we've talked to we've talked about it here and there over the course of the show. But, you know, I'm curious about your thinking in terms of um, I mean, let me put it this way. I have a sense that the story of the, um, you know, LGBTQ folks and Judaism is one that actually provides potentially some kind of roadmap for uh, optimism. But I'm wondering if you think it's sui generis or there are other things sort of going on there. Yeah, my, my basic sense is that, you know, however many years ago when it was when the Jewish community was for the most part not welcoming of LGBTQ Jews, somehow there were there was enough there were enough LGBTQ Jews who who cared about being Jewish. You know, somehow there was a critical mass such that rather than all going away, that many, you know, many of them or some of them created LGBTQ Jewish organizations in a way that I see less of among, for example, Jewish atheists or other kinds of people that might feel that the way that the Jewish community is organized is is not welcoming to them, whether that's from an identity standpoint or a point of view standpoint. And then I feel that what happened in LGBTQ synagogues and organizations like Svara was this really interesting Judaism that emerged and that turned out to be interesting and relevant to people who weren't gay and lesbian, you know, who weren't LGBTQ. And um, and that somehow that experience turned out to be um, turned out to be useful and helpful to all kinds of other Jews that felt excluded. And obviously that wasn't its purpose. Its purpose was to help this specific group of Jews who who needed that at that time in their lives. But I guess I'm I'm wondering if you see that story in a similar way, or if there are ways in which. It, the LGBTQ Jewish story continues to be actually sort of one of the more important pieces of the future of, of the Jewish story and or are there things that other groups can learn from it to say that we can go about things differently? Yeah, no, I think that's it. That's a, those are a really interesting set of points. And I'm, I'm basically in agreement with what you said. I mean, the, the case study I often mention um, uh, is a uh, congregation based Haverim in Atlanta, which, you know, started out as LGBT, mm-hmm. but then um, because it was LGBT, they were a little bit more innovative, a little bit more uh, liberal, and a little bit more politically engaged uh, than the other congregations in Atlanta, and uh, attracted just a lot of people who wanted that environment. So they weren't LGBT identified, but they did, uh, but they wanted those things, right? Then, and, and so, you know, they they then had the question that a lot of LGBTQ synagogues will now be facing. In fact, I think you know most already have just in the recent past. You know, which is how important that identity remains. You know, do we say that we? I think the Beit Haverim uses the language, if I'm not mistaken, of uh, we have roots in the LGBT community, but branches elsewhere. Da, 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 way of finessing it. They do have a you know a wonderful gay rabbi and a friend, Josh Lesser, and they have a lot of LGBTQ people there, but it's majority straight now because there was something that was innovative, interesting, good. You know, per, a little bit more progressive and a little more politically con, you know uh, active. So I do think I do think that offers a model. Um, you know, I think the the much bigger uh, elephant in the room are multi faith families, and it was interesting back when I used to do LGBT Jewish work, um, and when I was running an organization called Nahirim, there was a big study that came out about inclusion that focused on three groups: uh, LGBT, Jews of color, and uh, intermarried or multi faith families. And they, you know, the shocking bit of data was that actually the experiences were almost identical across these three very different groups, right? I mean, the the the, so the difference markers of those three groups are just very different, right? So Jews of color tend to be either from, you know, in families that were also, you know, not not white or not entirely white, right? Whereas LGBT didn't. Obviously, multi faith families these are people coming in, like very different vectors. But the same kinds of things seem to matter in terms of inclusion. Uh, so, you know, visibility, a certain kind of specific kinds of welcome, um, and so on. There's, you know, a whole sort of 
trainings that now happen about how to just do diversity trainings in, in synagogues. And it is it is curious, you know, there was just the news recently that one of the major uh, multi-faith Jewish organizations is going through some cuts, and, you know, there's a big Jewish multi-faith conference taking place in, uh, in Philadelphia, which could be really interesting. You know, I think in terms of numbers, you know, that's a group that really does dwarf uh, the LGBT community in terms of its size and its percentage of the Jewish community. Uh, again, it seems like so much of what we've talked about, it's like, do you choose the optimistic or the pessimistic perspective? <laughs> you know, my optimistic perspective, you know, I just remember before in the conservative movement, I was a little bit active in, you know, working on their LGBT stuff. And there really were people were saying, like, the sky would fall if the conservative movement allowed um you know, gay rabbis, let alone gay marriages. Like, this would be the end of the conservative movement as we know it. You know, in retrospect, it was really at the beginning, right? It was this, like, this fake issue that was kind of an albatross sitting, you know, hanging around uh, the conservative movement's neck, and all they could talk, talk about were, like, gay rabbis, when, in fact, there were much deeper systemic issues that they needed to be addressing, which now I think I think they are, uh, you know, under new leadership and, and so on, and without that kind of fake focus point. You know, it's like that wasn't really the issue. Uh, there were other issues that were more important. So the sky didn't fall. Um, the conservative movement in particular, of course, that like a, like the other movements that are having their struggles, but I think they're in a much better place now than when they were, um, you know, so afraid to, to take a step. And maybe that will be true for multi-faith or not. You know, I don't know. But it, it does feel like that to me, you know, the percentage of Jews who are non-white, so Jews of color, is, is still relatively small. Obviously, that will increase in the next generation. Um, but I think on the multi-faith side, we're talking about a group that's really much larger. And so I'm curious to see how that develops. Jay, it's sort of in closing, I'm curious if you you mentioned earlier, you talked about the Haredization of American Judaism. I'm curious if that's how you see it. Like, do you think that the future or a likely future of American Judaism is one with a with a growing, I mean, it already is, but that that, that trend will continue the uh, sort of growing and more dominant Haredi ultra-Orthodox community? Or do you think, you know, I, I remember a few years ago uh, in Israel, they were talking about how once the Haredi community reaches a certain size, it kind of can't be the Haredi community as we know it anymore, because there are just going to be too many people to support in the way that they've tended to support themselves. And people are going to have to go out and start getting jobs and doing all kinds of things that they're going to be exposed to the wider world. And, and you know, everything that caused the ultra-Orthodox immigrants to America in the early part of the 20th century to to go in another direction will essentially happen again. And um, and I'm curious what you think about that and also whether the people coming out of that uh, are potentially a source of the kind of uh, creative leadership that we might imagine for liberal Judaism, you know, in part because they're kind of, they're, they're you know, they, they have had excellent educations and, and have a lot of sands to uh, mix up. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I think... Um... You know, from your mouth to God's ears that the Haredi community will have to just grow up and get a job. I don't think that's true, certainly in America, uh, and even in Israel, it, it doesn't, doesn't, I don't know, for, yeah, like I said, from your mouth to God's ears. No, I, my my favorite subject that I'll talk about for, you know, for free all the time is uh, that I, I do think that the mainstream organized Jewish community just has not recognized or is not acting on these these obvious demographic shifts that are happening. You know, if it were up to me, little tiny programs like Footsteps here in the States and uh, uh, Hillel over in Israel, which help uh, Haredi Jews who want to leave, which just helps them adjust, which is an incredibly difficult transition. You know, I'm sure, you're sure a lot of listeners have read uh, Shalom Dean's book, All Who Go Do Not Return, and there's a whole literature now of ex-Orthodox uh, uh, writers. You know, it's an incredibly difficult uh thing to do on so many different levels, leaving the family and they don't have skills to support themselves in the modern job economy and just getting used to secular society. And I mean, it's just each one of those is, is a huge burden and we do almost nothing for them as a Jewish community. Um, you know, and we make it, it's, it's almost like we're making it as hard to leave as possible. You know, I don't think that um, non Haredi Jews need to like advertise on bus stops and convince all Haredim to leave. Uh, but I think we could at least make it as easy as possible uh, to do so. You know, we're sitting very comfortably not recognizing the threat of Jewish fundamentalism to all of the Jewish values that we've talked about so far. 
And uh, it is Jewish fundamentalism. That's what it is. It's not different from Islamic fundamentalism. It's not different from the way that certain parts of America now to, to be a Christian means to be basically a Christian fundamentalist. Um, and that that is happening. It, as you said, it's not a future tense prediction. It's a present tense read of what the data is. Um, you know, that's this is what's actually happening. And not only are, are, is the mainstream not helping people who want to leave, they're propping up the leadership by dispensing insane amounts of uh, aid and charity basically through the rabbinic establishment uh, and through the elite, which just further empowers the elite um, over everybody else. So I'm not one who feels that we need to go crusading in Haredi communities and liberate women and, you know, do everything and assume that we know, we know best. But we do know that a lot of people want to leave those repressive uh, contexts, and uh, we're not doing anything to help them. And we're hurting ourselves in that respect, because I definitely agree with your leading question <laughs> that are in excavating also, you know, sources of a lot of creativity and, and stuff. And if you just look, you know, among some of the most fascinating artists, Tel Aviv uh, or New York or, or elsewhere, you know, they, they're coming from, uh, from formerly Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox uh, contexts. They've uh, broken the safer barrier. That's a Reb Zalmanism. You know, they're, they're, they're able to open, crack open a Jewish book. Um, but more than that, they really grew up steeped in a very rich uh, environment. And now, you know, they have the capacity if they want to. You know, the majority don't. They just want to get on with their lives. But people like Shalom, you know, want to share it with, with this wider world. And so we're hurting ourselves doubly. We're depriving ourselves of, of the gifts of this population. And, you know, we're helping the slow motion demographic shift that ultimately pretends very, uh, very badly uh, for the American Jewish community. You know, you sort of know our big picture uh, point of view on this podcast and what we're trying to put out there is ideas that potentially um, allow new approaches to arise that um, involve Jews who are not finding connection with existing Jewish organizations uh, in developing new uh, expressions of Judaism and new organizations and, and new things that are going on outside the existing Jewish community. And and from your own experience or as an observer, just curious if there's anything that we haven't discussed yet with you that you think is really important that you just want to have a chance to say in closing. One of my gigs is going around as a scholar in residence to uh, to synagogues. And I've seen a lot of really interesting and sincere work going on, even within mainstream synagogues. Now, I think my sample space is biased because these are only the synagogues that were brilliant enough to invite me, right? So <laughs> they are, they're, all, they're all above average. But um, even so, you know, there is actually, I mean, I think for many of us, those that model, it's hard to see that model being sustainable and it's hard to see it really being even desirable. Like it's not the Jewish world we'd want to live in the kind of big box rule, you know, out, out in the suburbs and so on. But for some people that does meet their needs and I want to not seem like I'm flagging that off. I, I think there's actually a lot of innovative stuff happening. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's again, sort of a question of like connecting uh, people in those contexts with the types of Jew Jewishness that might be of interest to them. Just recently, the Isabella Friedman Jewish Retreat Center in Connecticut had a weekend, a, a singing weekend, people coming together. And it's like three, 200 people or something came together to sing Jewish songs all weekend, which to me sounds like a total nightmare. But for them, right, that's really exciting. <laughs> and each, you know, those people can all go back to their communities, right? And I'm, I would say, I don't know who's going. My, my hunch would be that the majority of them are in more traditional synagogue communities that they can go back and kind of pollinate you know, with the uh, experience that they've had at the Jewish Song Weekend. And that's, I think, a, you know, there is a lot of good stuff happening even within those synagogue communities. And that kind of a model, you know, where the people who are interested in eco go do eco and the people who are interested in social justice work go do that. And then they bring that in. Um, does that, that kind of more food court model rather than a restaurant um, seems to be thriving even within, you know, existing edifices uh, across the country. So I, I didn't want, I wanted to just put in that plug, not necessarily for that old system, but for just noticing that we're not necessarily starting to reinvent the wheel with nothing, that there's a lot going on within the, uh, the more conventional context that can be, uh, enlivened. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, we uh, were talking a while ago about the idea connected to this of, of Tim Tum, right? The idea that in, in traditional theology, you know, God makes himself smaller in order to make more room for human beings to take more responsibility. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting because I, I totally agree with you that sometimes some of the conversation that we have could be heard by people to say, you know, it's, it's down on existing Jewish institutions or it's pessimistic about them. But I I totally agree with you. That's not how I feel either. What I think is is more the case is is that you know when you're when you were once the big restaurant and now you're, it's an environment of food courts being kind of what's needed. Do you have the capacity, the internal emotional capacity, and and the financial capacity too to say, okay, we're going to change our business model and now we're going to be happily become one of the one of the stations at the food court and we're still going to serve the same food. What The food we serve is excellent. It's just we don't have to make the claim that this is the only kind of food there is or this is the only kind of food that's that's reasonable. And and not only that, but we can actually, by joining the food court, you know, we, we actually potentially are providing resources and uh, encouragement to the development of, of new approaches that are different from ours. And, and so we can happily live in a in a food court. I really love the image. Oh, no, forget it. If you don't sing my, my tune to Kedusha, you're not Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Jay. It's really been a great pleasure having you on the show. With my thank pleasure. You know, and uh, I'm really glad that uh, the work you're doing is, is out there in the world. And um, so keep up with that. Well, we'll certainly do our best. Uh, thanks again to Jay Michelson for a great episode. We really appreciate you coming onto the show. And uh, we want to close this episode out in the same way we always do by encouraging you to please be in touch with us. And the first way for you to do that is through our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. You can also be in touch via email. Uh, you can reach us at lex at nextjewishfuture.org or dan at nextjewishfuture.org. And third, you've got our website, uh, judaismunbound.com, where we post show notes for this episode and all of our others along with some other great resources. And the last thing we like to mention is that we have our Patreon page where you can make a small monthly donation to support the work that we do. And the way for you to do that is to head to www.patreon.com that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Judaism Unbound. Thanks again for listening and this has been Judaism Unbound. <laughs>